Hi everybody, welcome back. So we are now back on the Fisher 800B video series. And if you recall, we were to a point where we needed to rebuild the power supply. The B plus for the output section was okay, but moving forward we had found that there were a few problems with these capacitors. Namely, this one right here, when we tested it, the capacitors inside the can, I believe, are okay. The problem, I think, what happened was the common lead between the, the capacitor sections in here and the outside can have come disconnected. So essentially, these capacitors have capacitance with respect to one another, kind of like if they were in series, back-to-back -back series, <laughs> but they do not have uh, any reading with respect to the common lead or the, the outside can. So these caps are no good and of course that's messing up our lower B plus voltages for the, you know, for the tuner section and the preamp section and so forth. So we're, need, we're gonna need to get that all repaired and the way we're gonna do that is we are going to replace all of the can capacitors and what we are going to use, some of you have seen a preview of this in my last uh, random video. So I'm using for the first time these capacitors that I purchased from Hayseed Hamfest. And you can see this is not an endorsement. Um, I've read about them. I've read some good things about them. And I used the CE manufacturing capacitors, which were made at the old Mallory facility with the old Mallory capacitor building equipment <laughs> and a, a company purchased that all that equipment and went back into production with can capacitors in the traditional manner like they were made back in the day. I used those on the X101C project so if you go back and look at my X101C series you'll see that I use those caps in here. In this project, we're going to try these ones. And these are not built like a traditional can capacitor. You can see these cans are really fancy. They're mere polished, shiny, you know, and so forth. But they're very heavy, and I think they must be full of resin or something. But inside here are standard capacitors, you know, kind of like this one here. They're actually just, they put a standard 105C capacitor made by either Nichicon or Sprague or, you know, Panasonic, whomever, high quality stuff. And they put them in these cans and then build them like this. So the nice thing is all of the shapes and all of the values line up with the original factory caps. You can buy them custom made to your particular amplifier. So I've heard good things about them. We're going to try them, huh? That's the only way we're going to find out. So it's not an endorsement. I'm just showing you what I'm trying. We'll see the results for ourselves. All right. Now, as I was saying, um, that's part of what's wrong here. And the other thing is, I think because this cap, you know, wasn't working properly, this particular resistor, which if you look, you can't even see this last band, if that's a brown or what that what color that is because it's so burned but if we look at the schematic in the power supply section there is a uh, resistor and I think this is a brown is a one and red is two and this particular <laughs> thing right here I have no idea what the third band is but you can see there's some 12 K's and there's some 1.2 K's in there so we're going to have to figure out which one in the line this is and then we're have to get the correct uh, value and replace it because it is definitely not reading the correct value and let's get our meter so I can kind of refresh my own memory what the heck this thing was looking like oh, okay they need to make a meter that has a non-reflective display on it. Wouldn't that be great for all of you video people out there? I'm not a video person. I suck at it. I'm sure all of you that have been watching my videos for any length of time <laughs> realize that. Yeah, 206 ohms. So I don't know uh, 
you know, neither here nor there if we're reading across something or whatever, but I can tell you whatever this is in here, I don't think it's supposed to be 206 ohms. So we're going to remove it from circuit. All right, a lot of you ask how I remove components like this without damaging things. And really, everybody has their own method of doing it. And I think the one common thing is be careful. Take your time. Don't be in a hurry. And you can do this. So let's uh, start with this one. When I replaced this diode, uh, I just put it through the hole and I didn't wrap it around or anything to make it easy to remove because I knew this was going to be getting replaced. By the way, these Hayseed Hamfest caps they're not going to show up overnight. You, they're going to take a while. Uh, a lot of them are made to order and even the ones that aren't made to order it's still going to take a little while for them to fill the order. So make sure you plan your order far enough ahead that you know you're not going to be waiting. I mean I had to wait for this and that's why this project kind of went on the back burner for a little while. And uh, I don't want to move that too much. Let's see. So a good desoldering pump goes a long way with stuff like this and a nice hot iron. This uh, Hacko iron gets really hot even though it has a small tip. I have one even with a larger tip. That it'll outdo most of my Weller guns and so forth. Um, and I've gotten to the point where I, that's about all I need to use anymore. I don't really need anything else on the bench. But again, these are relatively expensive. You can use a soldering gun, like one of those Weller 120 watt, and they're great. I've used those. That's what I used for years and years on this type of thing before this. All right. So I'm just chattering away here. And working around the camera, which I'll probably bang the camera in this video, I'm sure, because I'm working right around it. And uh, I have the standard lens on it right now. I, I don't have the, I have a, a lens that goes over top of this camera lens that turns it into a wide angle, but uh, it can distort the image a little bit. So unless I'm looking for a really wide view, I don't have it on there. I'm going to have to clean this off a little bit more, maybe a little bit of solder wick. And the biggest thing is we will have to get the big gun out later to clean, you know, where, where the can capacitors attach to the chassis. You got to really heat that up a lot to melt that solder and get it off of there. So we'll get to that later. Let's see. And of course, getting close enough to see everything is always a challenge especially with my crappy eye sight. You know, my, I have some friends and relatives that got that uh, LASIK surgery on their eyes. I'm not a candidate for that because I need the, I'm at the age now where, you know, it's not just, I'm not just nearsighted, but I'm also becoming farsighted, which is pretty common as you get older. So you need multifocal lenses, and even bifocals don't really work real well with me. I need the focal zone, so the progressive lenses are what I use. And they have since come out with a procedure uh, where, similar to when you get your cataracts repaired, where they remove the, your natural lens and they put an artificial lens in, they can now do a lens implant, you know, on your eye and supposedly put a multifocal lens in there and give you perfect vision uh, where you know you're not you're just replacing the lens rather than what they do with LASIK surgery. It's a little little more involved procedure but apparently it works. So I'm thinking about that. My cousin had that done. He's a little bit older than me and he said it was the best decision he's ever made because for the first time in many, many years, he has perfect vision. Now, he was getting cataracts, 
So that kind of pushed the issue for him a little bit more than myself. I don't have any problems like that, but uh, I guess you can get just the lenses anyway, you know, and it'll have the, uh, the prescription. That would be cool. Why am I talking about that? We're working on an amplifier. I'm talking about glasses. You see what happens when I work on this stuff? <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, clean this off. And again, this particular cap that we're replacing is still not too bad, although you can see the that gunk that's coming out of there. This cap has been heated up obviously um, and it's probably it, if it's not degraded it's probably going to fail so when stuff gets this old and it's this valuable of a, of a piece of gear and you're planning on actually using it rather than just displaying it I tend to just even when these read good I'll replace them that being said I've had a lot of these old uh, Mallory can capacitors back, you know, that were 1950s vintage and so forth that are still like the day they were made. I mean, they, they're perfect. And then I have other ones that are just shot. They're just dead shorted. It seems to be totally random. And uh, you can't really make a blanket statement by saying all of them are bad and need replaced or all of them are always good and you can leave them alone. I just think like anything else, there's, uh, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. If you'd rather not take chances and you can afford it, replace them. But the warning is you will, you will have to make a monetary investment to do this. These caps are not cheap. And it doesn't matter if you get the CE manufacturing ones or the Hayseed Hamfest. They're all similar pricing anyway. Uh, which that similar pricing to me is expensive because <laughs> I'm sure when these were brand, you know, back in the 50s, uh, I don't know that they were that considered that expensive because they were mass produced and very common. And, you know, now I don't know, not so much. So this one's sitting up on a mica insul or a, on a Bakelite insulator. You see that? The, the common lead of this is not touching the chassis. And you'll see when we get the capacitor out, this particular cap is insulated uh, on the outside. It has a paper cover on it. Unfortunately, I'm having a problem getting this out. And it could be that some of this goop melted in here and is sticking. Because it's not, it, does, it's feels, it feels like the whole thing is stuck to the Bakelite, which I have new Bakelite washers. I have those if we need to, to do that, but I would rather use the original if we could. Give me a second, see if I can pry this loose. Okay, there might have been some leaky stuff because this was a little bit tough to, it felt like it was just stuck. Let's see here. And you can see where it kind of squished through there, through the vent holes. What happens is these caps start to develop high ESR. Or if they just haven't been powered up in a long time, when you turn them on and they'll reform for the first, you know, after sitting for so long. These will heat up a lot. And sometimes that tar that's in there will melt. And it'll squish through all of the little openings in there. That doesn't mean the cap is totally shot. It just means that it had to reform at some point in time and it got hot. It might be good now, but then again, it might not. Let's test it. Okay, this is a 200 microfarad at 250 volts. And look, it is right dead on 203 microfarads. This cap is good. You can see it right there. And ESR is 0.13 ohms, and I think that's pretty good. Your theta, this sort of stuff isn't quite as important. The dissipation factor is 0.177. So this cap is in really, really good shape. And if you want to know what some of this stuff means, I'm not going to go over it in this video. I did a, a review of another uh, 
capacitor test or LCR meter and where we calibrated the meter itself and went through and talked about what all that is. Check it out sometime um, and it'll explain a lot of that. But again, we could reuse this cap. It's good right now, but we're going to replace it because we're already in there. If the other ones get replaced, it's kind of crazy not to just do the set. And I ordered this as a set. You can get you can get the Hayseed Hamfest capacitors in a complete rebuild kit where they'll sell you all of the caps uh, for a particular model and make of amplifier, which is really cool. So this is C102, and if we look here, C102 is this one right here, this 200 microfarad. And it's an insulated one. So let's take it out. And you can see, here's our replacement. Very similar. They do a wonderful job from what I'm seeing so far. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit over here. And it's a lot easier to work with stuff if you clean it off first. And by the way, I took a lot of pictures of all of this from different angles so that we know exactly how it went so we can put everything exactly how we found it and keep it as close to stock looking as possible. Um, so I'm just taking some isopropyl alcohol and a brush that I cut the bristles down to make it a little stiffer so you can get in there and kind of scrub the flux and all that nastiness off. And that just kind of prepares everything. And then I'll check the other side underneath, make sure it's clean. And it is pretty clean under there. Not bad. And this is nice because I don't have to drill these rivets out now because I was able to get this off. And then we'll just put the new one on. And it goes just the same way as the, as the old one came out, the new one goes in. So we'll come in here like this, lift up the amp a little bit so we can get in there. And that's it. There it is. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist these just a little bit just like the originals were. And that'll lock them in place. And that's it. We can put our wires back on and everything should be ready to go. Okay, I have the wires placed back into the new capacitor. And uh, I just stripped back the insulation ever so slightly on them so that you have some fresh wire. So you don't have to worry about that, uh, you know, stress <laughs> cracking. And now that they're all in place, we'll solder them up and, of course, we'll get smoke all over the lens. Let me move the camera because I don't want to smoke up my lens with, with flux. So I'll go this way. I'll go at an angle and then I'll zoom in, try to get you centered. I told you I sucked at camera work. Not my thing. Okay, there we go. Now the smoke will not go into my lens. All right. And then we'll get this one in there. And this last one here. And what I did with this is this particular terminal, if you see this wire here, it went over to this terminal here. And this terminal does not have a hole in it. So this would not fit over there. So I just got some Teflon insulation, really nice stuff, and some new solid bus wire. It's silver coated copper and I lengthened it just a little bit so it can go over to this other cap. And I'm going to leave it off for right now and leave it a little bit long. And when we go to replace this capacitor here, then uh, we'll go ahead and, and trim it down to length. So one cap down, 
three more to go. Well, four more to go because we're going to replace this one. Let me back you up. We're going to replace this one with the proper capacitor that belongs in there so that it looks more, a uh, little more original. That kind of looks, I don't know. I'd hate to have somebody open and s open it and see it looking like that. So we're going to replace that. Okay, the next capacitor we're going to replace is C101A and 101B. So C101, which is going to be this capacitor here. And just in case you want to know, because inquiring minds want to know, I wanted to check this, is do these leads actually connect to the case? And the answer is, if I touch the case and I touch one of the leads, you can see there's a direct short. So yes, the case is in fact on these one, on these metal ones connected to the grounding tab. Very nice. All right, let's get the old one out. Now this one, if we move over a little bit and we zoom back in, you'll see that this one is soldered directly to the chassis. So we're going to really have to get some heat on this. So I'm going to actually use the large iron for this one so that I can get this loose because there's an awful lot of stuff that needs to be pulled up off of there. So we're going to start with cleaning my desoldering pump. You can hear that <laughs> into the garbage. And here we go. And this might be a little bit tricky because now we have some other wires in the way and we're going to have to be very, very careful not to melt any of our wires. And you just have to kind of move them up out of the way. I don't want to bend them too much because I want them to retain their original shape and position but I want to get them up off the chassis because it's going to get really hot there and I don't want them to melt. So now we're going to go in here and you can see how strong this iron is. It just, it melts it right down. See that? And then I can use this to pull this right out. Oh, boy, I'm banging the camera here. Okay, look at all that that came out of there, wow, big blob, all right, go back in here, well it would help to rearm the soldering pump, the desoldering pump I should say. Why do you guys watch me? I don't get it. Well, <laughs> I get it. It's fun to watch a train wreck. As I bang the camera again. This is crazy. This is going to be a horrible video, but hey. <laughs> it's what it is. All right. Let's see if we can if it'll pop loose yet. Oh yeah. It's starting to. Heat it up a little more. You have to be patient with this. I mean, there's just no quick and easy way to do any of this stuff. And there it is. So take that one out. Hope to unbend it. And, and again, I'm going to, I'll clip a little bit off the end of this and strip it back a little bit so that we have some fresh wire when we get to that point. Okay. The other thing is these duckbill pliers are a big help. You can see right here. Um, I don't know how much I've been out of frame. I don't know, but these are very good. They're made by Crescent. And let's see if I get it to focus for you. Focus, focus, focus. Nope. There we go. How's that? Can you see that? 1037, model 1037-8. 
I love these things. I use them at work an awful lot because there's a lot of big terminals and things like that where you kind of have to bend them. Uh, and these work really, really well for that. They're very strong. And uh, I have two pairs of them. I have a really, really worn pair that I use at work. And then I have these that are on the bench and they're, in, as you can see, in relatively good condition. But uh, I really like them. Now let's see if we can get in here. And there's actually two of these tabs that are soldered like this. So we'll have to go on the other side and do it as well. And then what I'll do is I'll take a little bit of soldering braid and I'll just kind of mop up around here a little bit if I can. And I'll put a little bit of flux on there to make it stick a little better to the wick. Just put a little drop down there. I don't know if you're seeing all of this. The camera is kind of facing away from me, or at least the viewfinder is. There we go. And then we get this one here. And that should be able to help us. Yeah, that'll come out now. Okay, now we have to take this strain relief off. Let me back up a little bit. This strain relief is going to have to come out so that we can move that wire bundle because I sure don't want to see that get melted by my soldering iron that is wickedly hot. Let's see here. There we go. We'll put this all off to the side. And another thing you're going to find out, don't get up tight. <laughs> if it happens to you but these strain reliefs quite often will will dry out really bad and get super brittle and they'll just crack so you can still buy these and you may need to buy some spares this one is still a little bit uh, flexible there's it's still working but I can feel where if I move it too much it'll break and crack so we will try to reuse it to keep the original look. If not, we'll put a new one in. All right. Let's move this over. And I'm being very careful not to flex these coaxes too much because they break very easily. You just have to take your time and don't force anything really badly. Okay. This time we will the pump there get it ready so that that's another famous thing you will see me do is I'll forget to arm this thing and then I'll get everything heated up and then well doesn't work I guess that's And this stuff doesn't stay melted for long. You have to really get in there and work fast because that chassis just wicks the heat away so quickly. So once you get it heated up to where it'll pool, you need to get in there right away and vacuum it up. Okay. Now we might be able to get this with the braid again a little bit. Put another drop of the 
flux on there. As I bang the camera. All right. Okay. And it's going to be diff. This one's going to be a little bit difficult to get out, but because of the way it's twisted, it's hard to get the solder out from around there. You just have to, you don't have to push real hard. I'm not actually putting pressure on the tip of the soldering iron, believe it or not. I'm letting mostly the weight of the iron do the work, and then I'm just moving it around to kind of dig into the solder to get it to melt and to pull up a little bit. Once you get it to do that, then the braid can do its job. Let's see how close we got this, if I can twist it now. Oh yeah, there it is. Not too bad. And then once you get this straightened out, you can clean it off a lot easier. And get the rest of this stuff that's along the front here. And then that'll, this should just pop right out after this. All right, we're gonna use our duck bills once again. We're gonna finish loosening these up and then we're gonna take the other wires off in the same manner that we did with the other ones and we should be ready to go. Okay, not sure if you can see around there, but we have the first tab soldered in, and I'll do the other one on camera for you. See it right there. And this is why you need a really hot iron to do this, because it takes a lot of heat to get this to flow properly. So the first thing I do is I just get, get it to puddle on one side just to get it started like that Then I come to the other side and make sure all my wires are out of the way it's easier to use thicker gauge solder on this as well because it uses an awful lot to make that pool there like that and that's it you don't need a whole ton of this I mean I'm getting a little bit of you just need enough to tack it down, but there you go. Now that's on there, it's not going anywhere, and that's a good solid ground that's not going to go anywhere. Now we can go ahead and reconnect our wires like we did on the other side and put it all back together. Okay, always check your work. I had inadvertently connected this blue wire to this ground terminal when it actually needs to be up here. So when I put this in, I kind of went through and checked and looked at my pictures, and sure enough, I got this wire wrong. Good thing we caught it. So that's why it's really always pays to take your time, check your work, make double sure that everything's wired correctly. All right, now we're moving across to here. Get back to here again. And you can see I have most of the connections here, and I am now currently working on this resistor, making sure I know what resistor this is. Okay, this isn't super clear until you really step back and look at it. But if you notice, we have the output of this voltage doubler diode here. So you have a voltage doubler circuit. It goes into one C102, which is this first capacitor here that we replaced. And then you can see it goes to a 1.2K resistor, which goes to C101A. Now doesn't look like that here, does it? But here's what's going on. This blue wire is taking the signal over to here. And I'll show you here. Let me slide the camera over. The blue wire leads over to right here. See it? And this is the center tap, or your B plus, right here, for your transformer. So see B right here? There's B going into the center of your output transformers. So right there's your B voltage. That goes through this 1.2K resistor, which is right here. It goes through all of these across here. All right. 
Those are all tied together. And that happens to be your C voltage, which you can see those are your screen voltage. So this is your screen grid supply right here. Now that needs a capacitor on that side. So there is a orange wire. You can just, if I move you over, you can just see it right here, orange wire. And it comes around and it snakes its way over to right here, which is this other 200 microfarad capacitor, which is or I'm sorry, to the first 40 microfarad, so C101A. So you have 101A and 101B. See that? And you can tell the next resistor goes to C95C, and that happens to be a 1.2K resistor. So that burned up resistor here looks to be a 2 watt 1.2k resistor. So we're going to get a 1.2k better quality resistor. Actually being that this is a carbon comp resistor this is a 1 watt and this is the half watt if you take a look. Over here would be a half watt. That's a 1 watt not a 2 watt. 2 watts are a lot bigger. And this is a 2 watt flame proof metal film. So we're going to put that in and that will be a suitable replacement. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tack one end in to this side and I'm going to leave the other end hang until we get that other capacitor removed. I've pulled out the capacitor C95 A, B, and C. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. If I go from the can which is supposed to be the negative to any of these, it would appear that these caps are all open, right? Let me turn this off, it gets wonky. And you can see they're all appearing to be open, right? But if I read from one section to another, I'm reading good capacitors. So what that means is when you look inside of one of these caps, I'll draw you a little picture. The way they work is the can, you have your three capacitors like this, really badly drawn capacitors. And what they do is they tie all three of these together and these go to the can. And then each one of these goes to one of those ring terminals, kind of like that. So what's happening is, if I, if I measure from here to here, here to here, and here to here, it reads open. Because where this little connection is between the can, which is this part here, and these, is open. So what's happened is that internal connection has broken inside here. Probably if we disassembled the cap, if we could take it apart, you could see where it came disconnected, and that's probably the issue. But uh, and see can common negative. I don't know if you could see that. But that's because of that all three of these capacitors are almost like they're not in circuit. So see how they're tied together like that? So you have this one, this one, and this one. So there it's like if you took these and lifted the ground. So this would have like a bypass capacitor over it and this would have a bypass and then it would be backwards against here through this 100k so it would almost be like a short which is why this 1.2k right here was getting hot so there's your problem and that was what was causing the power supply to be weird but if you notice Prior to that, this resistor is kind of like isolating everything, so our B voltage and our C voltage, which are the two that we need to drive the output section, they're fine. Now, eventually, you know, back here you're going to have problems because all of these, the, the further down the line you get, the worse the voltage was. 
So, and you can see this E voltage, which is clear here at the end, it's actually a little bit off. So we may have to do something in here. We'll see what happens to our drivers, but I think it's not going to make a big difference. Anyway, it's fixed. And there's C95 all installed and ready to go. So now we got to go to this last one here, and then we'll put that uh, those that thousand microfarad for the uh, bias supply, and the caps will be replaced. Now another trick you can do if it's too difficult to get in there to desolder the wires, and you know you're going to just dispose of the can, you can just snip off the leads with a big set of wire cutters like I did there, and that allows you to get in there a lot easier and remove these and then now it's very easy to remove the wires from the terminals and put them back on to the new terminals of the new capacitor. So that's what I'm going to do. All the capacitors are installed and I took this to this dual insulated capacitor that was in there and I, I replaced it as well so it doesn't it looks a lot better this way I think little more original and we have all the resistors are replaced and they're all intolerance any of the bad ones have been replaced and this one had been replaced by the previous owner or by somebody in the past and that is capacitor C54 and comes after this little 10k resistor and I haven't measured the 10k yet I'm sure it's going to be okay but we're going to measure it and I think we're ready to go. Now, of, of the five capacitor cans that were in this amplifier, three of them were good, which would be these three right here. And when I say good, I mean these almost could be just put back in and used somewhere else, although I won't because of how old they are. But these were good capacitors. It just goes to show how long these can capacitors can last. But two of them were bad. And I'll show you on this one. So this is the one, if you recall, that the common terminal had come disconnected from the can. And you can see if we move over to the meter and I connect it up, it won't read anything. See, just nanofarads is all it reads. It should be reading like 40 microfarads or 50 or something. And if I go from one section to another it will actually read something see because it's reading through the capacitors as we showed earlier so this one's bad this one was from the bias supply and it is really bad so if we go from there to either section it's reading farads, which, you know, that's not right. 425 farads. I don't think so. Either that or this is the most efficient capacitor in the world. But you can see it's shot. These are only supposed to be a 1,000 microfarad cap at 35 volts. So this cap was completely shot, dried out, no good. And that's probably why the original tubes burned up, because the bias supply was shot, because that capacitor is bad. No doubt when you put power to it, I'm sure it was shorting out um, or something was going wrong when it was under load. So there you have it. We're ready to test this thing out. I'm going to flip it up on its side. I'm going to remove the power tubes initially. We're just going to do a nice slow power up and make sure the wiring is correct and make sure everything comes up the way it's supposed to. Okay, I have the meter connected to chassis ground. I'm going to connect up to here. And you can see I just turned it on real quick and off. I have 35 volts going into the mains right now through my Variac. If I turn this on, 137 volts. And we're looking right now over here. We're looking at this part right up here. And you can see it's very low because I have low mains voltage in there right now. And if we go down the list, we're not going to see a huge voltage drop like you, like you should see here because you need a load on these resistors for them to work and limit the current. 
so all these these resistors are almost like they're not there right now as long as there's no load now there is a tiny load from the other tubes but they're not they don't have enough filament to heat up yet so once again these voltages are going to be a little bit high or they're going to be a little bit off I should say okay so if I go from here and if we look at our voltage doubler circuit if I go to the negative side of that insulated can it should read about half of what we're reading up here so you see that it's 195 so I've got 140 volts so we should see somewhere around 70 volts over here ah, there you go 70 volts so that's working if we go up to this first line up here where it goes through this 12k and we looked at that earlier that's clear up here at the top let me see if I can back you out enough to see it probably not hold on I'll move the camera I think I got everything in shot here okay and this goes over to this bus here that th this is the screen grid supply so if we connect here 136 and you notice how the voltage is not dropped through that resistor because we don't have any load on it so it's just charging the capacitor on the other side of the resistor to the same voltage everything wants to be equalized right okay now we're going to come back and it comes through that orange wire right here there's the orange wire and it goes over to here and we should see the same voltage right here and we do then we go over to the other side of the resistor and there's a slight drop you can see but if we see a severe drop right now and any of the resistors are getting warm it means that there's a short in that part of the circuit and the resistor is having to limit the current so all I'm doing right now is I'm chasing through all this to make sure that we're not seeing any of that and we're not so far we come out of there we go to this next one here that's good and I'll zoom you in a little bit tighter again okay quit bouncing okay so that's good and then to the next side that's good and come over to here good now we're looking at the lower side I'll show you what I mean by the lower side these voltages down here we're gonna look at now okay and you see all these 125 ohm resistors they're up here so I have to zoom you back out again and those are located right up here in the upper right hand corner and we'll just go right down the list here we have our voltage there 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 and then that 10k half watt resistor we were talking about right there so far everything looks good we're not having any problems and this tells me that our power supply at least under limited voltage is working so now we're going to ramp it up a little bit and I'm going to go back to here and I'm just going to bring the voltage up a little bit let's take it up to go up to about 50 about 55 and that's what we should see and you're going to find out that right around 90 volts to 100 volts you're probably already going to be at that 395 because there's no load on the circuit when you rectify that AC voltage whatever the peak of that voltage is okay which is going to be 1.414 times the RMS voltage that's what a capacitor will charge up to if there's no load on the circuit once you apply a load to the circuit that voltage will drop to the RMS voltage okay 
if that makes sense. So because we're not putting that load on, we're looking at the peak voltage on that capacitor instead of the RMS voltage. And therefore, it's going to read high. If I take that 395 that they're calling for up there, and I times that by 1.414, you're going to get 558 volts. So if I put 120 volts on there, it's going to be a lot higher than 395. And I'll show you that as we go up. There's about, wait a second, there's about 75 volts. And you can see we're already getting up there. There's 90 volts, and you can see we're getting 335 volts. There's 100 volts. So now we're already at 100 volts means we're already over, well, we're not to 395 yet. 115 volts, now look at that. I'm at 424, I'm way over that 395. And if I go a little bit more to 120, 443. And that's through the resistors and so forth. There is a little bit of a load on this circuit because of the small tubes that are still in there. But you can see how that peak voltage will get you. <laughs> that's why a capacitor needs to be rated higher than, than the voltage in the power supply that it's supplying. Because think about it. Until these tubes warm up and start conducting, this voltage is going to shoot way up to its peak voltage or close to the peak voltage minus the little bit of losses in here. And those capacitors have to, at least for that little bit of time, you know, for that 10 seconds or 30 seconds, whatever it takes for the tubes to warm up, it's going to be, it's going to have to be able to handle that excessive voltage. So that's why, you know, when you have a 450 volt power supply, you can't put a 450 volt rated capacitor. You have to have like a 500 volt capacitor or higher. That's why, if that makes sense. Now, some of the old CAN capacitors, they were rated at 450 volts, but they rated them, they, they, they rated them to work in a 450 volt supply, knowing that you would exceed that during turn on because the way that tubes worked back then. And so an old CAN capacitor, when it says it's a 450 volt cap, they can probably handle above that a good bit, like 500 plus volts. That's why when you're using a modern replacement, a modern capacitor is rated for the actual maximum voltage that it can handle. Don't go above it because chances are you're gonna damage the cap eventually. Just another little tip there. All right, our power supply is good. I'm happy. Uh, before we do anything else, let's look at the bias supply and make sure that we have that, our negative bias. Uh, let me see where it's going. Negative bias up here. Where's my wire coming in right? Is it here? Yes. So right now it's at, I only have 65 volts going in. I have my negative 13.7. And that'll go up a little bit because the voltage is really low right now. So we do have our negative bias there. And up here, there's our bias supply. Negative 14, I'm sorry, I was checking in the wrong part, wrong point. Negative 14. And it'll go up a little bit because it's set higher than that, I believe. I think we're ready to put some tubes in and see what happens. Okay, we have a 120 volts dialed up on the Variac. And we're now going to check the actual plate current. And the way I'm doing that is I'm going to measure between the anode, or the, I mean, the center tap of the output transformer and the anode tap, or the one plate tap. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the resistance. And you can see our resistance there is about 116 ohms. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. 
116. And then I'm going to switch to DC volts. As you can see, DC volts. And I'm going to bring you down here. And we're going to measure the voltage drop across the output transformer winding. And then we're going to use a little bit of Ohm's law to try to calculate what our plate current is. Have to give it a minute or two as the tubes warm up. Now remember, this is only half. So we want somewhere between 60 and 70 milliamps total for both tubes. So I want somewhere between 30 and 35 milliamps per tube. And you can see this is starting to settle somewhere around 3.6. So don't, don't worry about the minus, it's just the what direction I have the meter. All right. So 3.6, we're going to go down here to the calculator. 3.6 divided by 116. And we got about 31 milliamps. That's really good. And I never touched the, the bias since the last time I was messing with it. So as long as we stay within that 70 milliamps or so forth, we should be good. Now I wanted to do a little bit of uh, comparison. So just for giggles and grins, here is a Sylvania, just a old 7591, not 7591A. And if we're looking in class AB push-pull, and we have 300, and we have about 395, right around 400 volts on the plate. And we look down here, grid number two, they want it to be about 350, so they want it about a 50 volt drop. This amp is running a little hot, it's running at only about a 20 volt drop. And they're saying they want about negative 16 volts on there. But more importantly, what they're saying is max signal plate current. And if we go across here, the maximum signal, or I'm sorry, zero signal plate current is what we want. They're saying about 85 milliamps. So ideally, we want this to be around 42.5 milliamps per tube. And I'm running it very cool right now. Now that could give us a wee little bit of distort, crossover distortion, but I'm going to run it cool for a little while. So you can see, we, we want to have about 42.5 milliamps per plate. Right now we're looking at 31. So plenty of headroom. Now, here's the thing. If I turn my voltage up to about 125 volts, and that's about as high as it goes. I'm actually around 126 right now. Our voltage changes to about 4.6. And if we go 4.6 divided by 116, you're right at 39 milli milliamps. So there's about a seven million or an eight milliamp difference uh, between 120 volts and 127, 126 volts right now. So it's still well within that range. Now, to one of the com somebody in the comments, to your point, you are correct. Because I have a regulated bias supply, when the B plus voltage changes and when the bias voltage changes, it's also, it, my, my bias is not changing because it's regulated. So when the B plus voltage goes up, you actually need a little bit a more bias voltage. And you can see right here, back to our chart, they want you to go about another half volt. So if we go from 400 volts to 450 volts plate voltage, then you want this to go from minus 16 to minus 16.5 to keep it in line. And so, it, yes, it, it, it will change a little bit, and yes, the voltage will move, but just to your point, because this, this is all good stuff, I mean, this is interesting to me at least, 
if I just look at the actual voltage as if it were going to be through the old resistor divider network, I'm at negative 31 volts right now, which would be divided down to whatever with our voltage divider, right? Because we had, originally we had this little, these two resistors here. And if I move this down from 127, you can see I'm right now I'm at 127 volts. If I move it down to 120, well, I'm going to say 119, 120, that drops to 29 volts. Okay, so we go from 29 volts to about 30 volts. Okay. So it's only moving about one volt. Now remember, it's only moving one volt, <laughs> okay, on that power supply. But after it goes for a, through a voltage divider, you're not even going to get a one volt change. It's going to be less than one volt. So yes, it will track with the with fluctuations in mains voltage, but no, it will not track enough to bring that in. The only way you would want to keep that in perfectly, you know, that you would be able to do that would have to be a feedback loop where when that voltage when the, when your plate voltage changes the bias will act on that automatically and you would have to have a monitor circuit to do that and a comparator and so forth and it could be done it could be done but I don't think it would make a big enough difference to really matter <laughs> so anyway this will be fine but to your point yes it does change a little bit and yes that might be an advantage if everything were work, you know, would fall into place. But uh, with with how the way a transformer works, I don't know. The other thing I changed was on these feedback capacitors, which this filter network. I put this 33k bleeder resistor across this one cap and it, it basically has almost no effect on the feedback, the, the shape of the feedback signal, the, the negative feedback. But what this will do is this keeps the feedback loop from being an open circuit. And you should never, you should never turn on a vacuum tube amplifier without having a speaker load connected to it. But people do that sometimes. In this case, this would set up a, an open loop with no, no feedback. And because of that, I worry that there might be feedback, that you might get an, the amp might break out into low frequency oscillation or something. So by having this, this high resistance in here, that'll keep that from happening. Okay, that's all that does. So it's not going to change the shape of the, you know, of the feedback. So we're still going to have a flat waveform and everything, or a flat response curve, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a little bit out of it here. Been a long day. But that's why that's in there. All right. Let's connect up some speakers and let's listen to what it sounds like. Okay, I have some YouTube safe stuff here and my nasty lapel mic, but at least it'll give us an idea if we're getting any sound. Let's start it up. Wow, this song, this is the first I listened to this one. It's called Oh My by Patrick Patricos, and it's off of the YouTube library. It has some really amazing, uh, really wide stereo separation. So I guess I'll, I'll remember this song because this one's good for the stereo separation. Of course, I'm using a mono lapel microphone, so you probably didn't hear anything. But I can assure you that sounded really, really nice. So 
I think we're in another point here where we can stop this video and uh, get this uploaded. I would call this a success so far. Let me turn the amp off. And, well, it's shaping up to be a nice project. Okay, well, you know what I'm going to say. I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I hope you enjoyed this. I had a lot of fun. And uh, we'll be back again real soon. Take care and stay well, everybody. Bye-bye.